going to hear from Megan O'Rourke, and uh, she's a Virginia Tech. Her background includes a PhD in agricultural ecology. She works on things like in integrated pest management, pollinator conservation, wildflower habitat restoration on vegetable and cattle farms, and climate change. She works here, works around the world. So, Megan, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, when you think about agricultural systems, do you envision a, a picture like this where it's, you know, full of family values and, and people are living on the land and passing knowledge from one generation to the next um, and loving what they do? Or do you envision something a little bit more like this? It's high tech, big machinery, and more industrialized. Um, I would say that industrialization of agriculture has been going on in the United States for well over 100 years. And by industrialization, we're talking about bigger farms. We're talking about more intensive production systems. So more chemical fertilizer and uh, pesticide inputs, more machinery to manipulate the soils and to harvest our crops. And in the 70s, we had a uh, bit of a no notorious secretary of agriculture named his name was Earl Butts, and um, he would talk to farmers who would go around and he would tell them, you need to plow up every bit of land you can get your tractor on and plant fence row to fence row. And his motto was, get big or get out. Now, to his credit, he wasn't precipitating changes to agriculture. He was really responding to them, maybe frankly giving good advice to farmers. These graphs show big changes to agricultural production systems that have happened since the 1850s. So in this top graph, we see that land in production in the US about tripled in 100 years between 1850 and 1950. At the same time, we saw about a tripling of the number of farms that peaked around the 30s. And then um, from 30s into the 70s, we saw uh, a consolidation of farmland. So we had about a doubling in the average size of farms. So we have more farmland, fewer farms, and um, larger farms. Now, I would say this industrialization of agriculture is set to go global. So in 2009, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization uh, commissioned a pretty famous study. It was about how to feed the world by 2050. Um, now this was an economic study, and they came up with a solution that we would need 70% more food in the year 2050. But I think we need to unpackage this number a little bit. So where does this data come from? Essentially, the economists were balancing supply and demand. So they wanted to know how much more food would we need to produce in order to not have the cost of food go up. And there's a few things that were driving uh, this outcome. Uh, first of all, of course, we're going to have population growth. We expect about 25% more people to be on the Earth in 2050 compared to today. So that would account for about 25% of the increasing demand for food. What else do we have? Here's a biggie, I think. So rising incomes. Economists find that as incomes rise, we have increasing demand for meat. So this is showing data for about, oops, uh, 50 years showing about five time increase in the number of cattle, chickens, goats, and pigs that we're producing and consuming around the world. And if you think back to your basic ecology 101, right, it's much less efficient to eat meat compared to eating directly plants. So it, you know, if you average between all the different kinds of animals, it, you can say it takes about five kilograms of grain to produce one kilogram of meat. So it's putting a lot more stress on our agricultural production system as we begin to eat more meat. And this is another one I haven't heard anyone talk about um, too much today, but it's biofuel policies. So um, this is just a, a decade worth of data showing how biofuel consumption around the world has about tripled. And in the US, that's a lot of corn. So every time you go to the gas station, you fill up your tank and you see 10% ethanol, you're essentially pumping corn into your gas tank. 
And we're pumping in so much corn that we're actually burning about 40% of uh, US corn crop. So if you think about how much that is, if all of Iowa was planted border to border in corn, that's like we're burning the entire state of Iowa in biofuels. So a huge demand on how much food product is being, needs to be produced, but isn't actually being used as food. So what does this industrialization of agriculture have to do with the environment and human health? Well, this is a study of uh, the focus of my lab. I work on how agricultural systems affect ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are the services that we all derive from a healthy ecosystem. So those services can be economic, right? A healthy ecosystem is able to produce food and fiber and wood products. They can be cultural benefits. Um, nature is beautiful. We intrinsically enjoy it. We recreate in it. We have tourism in nature. There can be ecological benefits. So pollination, natural pest control, photosynthesis are all benefits that we derive from nature. And there are basic regulating services um, from healthy ecosystems. We may not even appreciate them. They can be regulating the carbon cycle, which also then in turn regulates climate change. It can be regulating um, the water cycle so that we have clean, purified water. Um, so I want to talk briefly about some work from my lab about how industrial agriculture and is affecting carbon cycle and is affecting pollination and how that affects our health. So agriculture um, both contributes to climate change and is, can be drastically affected by climate change. That of course affects our health because if we're unable to produce food and we can't eat, we're certainly not going to be healthy. Um, this graph here shows uh, global greenhouse emissions by sector. And so what we have is in orange here, um, uh, data about agriculture contributing about 25% of greenhouse gas emissions on a global scale. This of course contributes to climate change. Um, and I think the old school way of thinking about climate change where we think about average global warming would actually not be that big of a deal. I think that agriculture could adapt if it was just about average warming. But what we have is more energy trapped into the atmosphere. And this energy is causing more extreme weather events. So more extreme drought conditions and flood conditions, which are actually very hard to adapt to in ag agricultural systems and can lead to complete catastrophic crop failures. So what can we do about this? Um, in 2015, the Minister of Agriculture from France proposed a policy. It's called the Four Per Meal Initiative. And to date, about 350 organizations, including 40 plus countries, have signed on to this idea. And so in the world, there's tons of carbon that's actually trapped in the soils. And so she proposed that if we could just increase soil carbon by 0.4% per year, that would actually completely offset all the greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors of the economy, which sounds great, right? Um, one of the major mechanisms for doing this is going from a full tillage system where um, soil is plowed up and the carbon is resp respired from the soil into the atmosphere to a no tillage system where residues are left on the ground and, and we plant seeds essentially by cutting into the soil. Um, that sounds great. So I have a graduate student who's doing his PhD thesis, basically doing global simulation models of looking at the effects on soil carbon of changing world agriculture from tillage systems to no tillage systems. And this map shows um, where carbon would accumulate in the world if we made this change. But is it enough? Well, unfortunately, no-till agriculture would not actually come even close to achieving uh, the four per meal goal of increasing carbon by 0.4% in the soil. The goal would be to sequester about nine petagrams of carbon, and this switch would sequester about 0.17 or 1 50th of the goal. So, 
I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about another way in which I think agriculture is related to uh, our health. So agriculture affects pollination and is also reliant upon pollination, of course pollination for our food. Again, having food produced is essential for our health. <laughs> so um, pollinators, perhaps you've heard, are in a pollinator crisis right now. So in any given year, we can lose about 50% of our honeybee hives um, to various reasons. And about 60% of our native species of bees are in decline for various reasons um, related to industrial agriculture, such as habitat loss, planting fence row to fence row, um, pesticide use, and a variety of uh, pathogens and parasites. Um, now, this is super important because 70%, 75% of our crops are actually pollinator dependent. And I, I like this picture. I don't know if the color shows it, but it shows all the colors of the fruits and vegetables that are pollinator dependent. And so it's really the nutritious part of our diets where our vitamins and minerals are coming from is from pollinators. So again, what can we do about this pollinator crisis? So in 2016, the White House came out with the Pollinator Partnership Action Plan. And one of its main goals is to restore 7 million acres of pollinator habitat by the year 2021. And this is my research. And you can kind of see what pollinator habitats look like throughout a growing season and across years. And this is some research coming from my lab. So I looked at pollinator rates on farms with and without pollinator habitats for strawberries and for winter squash. Um, pollinator habitat farms are in red and non-habitat farms are in blue. We did this research across 2017 and 2018. And we can see that in many cases, it, well in all cases except just in 2018 for strawberries, that the pollinator habitats did significantly increase pollination and marketable yield, yields of these fruits. But this is really very preliminary. We have no idea whether 7 million acres is enough to make a major difference. That's essentially two acres per farm across the United States. So just quickly recapping, um, I think the data that I've showed kind of sh indicates that small improvements to agriculture, um, to industrial ag agriculture may not be enough to see substantial changes. Certainly the idea of going to no-till agriculture isn't going to stop climate change. And we don't really know if 7 million acres of pollinator habitat is enough to reverse the pollinator crisis. So where do we go from here? Um, I think that we need a paradigm shift in the way we think about agriculture and its connections to human health. I think one of the first things that we need to think about um, is to stop taking for granted our uh, consistent and nutritious food supply. That's certainly not the case around the world. And first, we need to value what we have here in the United States. I think we need to stop assuming that we're going to have silver bullet solutions to s sustainable agriculture. Um, if we want I think to have radical changes, then we're going to have to have radical ideas of interdisciplinary, multifaceted solutions and the will to implement those solutions. And some things that we can start with is first, having the ability to actually work between health scientists and agriculturalists. So it's a bit of a pet peeve to me as a researcher that funding structures are completely fragmented. So the National Institutes of Health fund health research. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture funds agricultural research. And I don't really know a mechanism to have meaningful collaborations because so far, I don't know how to meaningfully get funding to do that. Um, I think we really need to wrap our heads around the idea of enough is enough. So do we actually need 70% more food by the year 2050? Or is that what we want? I think we know that. What we want isn't always what is good for us. Um, like I said, some of the reasons why we think we need so much food is our increasing meat consumption and biofuel policies. And I think we can roll back towards eating less meat and rolling back those biofuel policies. Um, and then finally, 
Now this might be a little bit controversial, <laughs> but I think we need to consider the idea of paying more for food. Maybe that looks like a tax on unhealthy food. Maybe that looks like mixing up the subsidy scene such that we're not paying more for uh, apples than we are for chicken thighs. Um, and I think that if we expect farmers to be stewards of the land, that there needs to be financial resources to support that. And I think if there was more money in the agricultural economy, that potentially um, there'd be more room for the best and brightest to go into agricultural careers so that we have new ideas and we bring that to the forefront in order to improve environmental sustainability, agricultural sustainability, um, and hopefully make all of us a little bit more healthy. And with that, I'm done. <laughs>